Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very warm welcome to our office here in Brussels. Uh, today we have quite a special uh, event because it's uh, a privilege to have with us three authors of a book that is just out a few months ago and that is not yet really picked up uh, uh, in, in some of the Brussels scene, I guess. But it is a very interesting book. I had the pleasure to read it. Um, and uh, it is very much uh, topical. Uh, it deals very much with the current uh, turbulent, volatile global context and the implications of what is happening now in this polycrisis world for the relations of the so-called West, eh, the European Union, but the West in general, with the so-called Global South. I don't know whether we can still use these terms, Global South, but in any case, it is uh, a, a common denominator for a number of countries uh, in uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And so today we have the pleasure to uh, have three of these uh, authors. And let me uh, present them to you. Eh? On my right hand, uh, we have Len Ishmael. Some of you may know Len because Len has been uh, ambassador uh, in Brussels, uh, representing the East Caribbean states, also chair of the ACP Committee of Ambassadors uh, for quite some time. Um, and then uh, she also has a past in the organization of East Caribbean states. Uh, she has been working for the United Nations. It is really an impressive uh, track record. I'm not going to uh, mention everything, but maybe uh, just to mention as well that you're also a professor at the University of Brussels, eh, VUB, and at the Mohammed, Mohammed VI University in Rabat eh, in Morocco. And of course, an associate of the Policy Center of the New South, for whom we also welcome two guests uh, who uh, are also here with us, famous uh, think tank uh, in uh, North Africa, dealing also with uh, many of the issues that we will be discussing today. And then on my uh, uh, far right hand, we have, we have Christian Bachmeier. And Christian Bachmeier is really an Asia expert. He's someone who has a very long track record in Asia, uh, 30 years of experience, having worked as well as CEO of uh, an Indonesian uh, big uh, company, um, and uh, publishing a lot on the role of China, on uh, the role of ASEAN, and the uh, southeastern uh, uh, Asian <laughs> countries. For us, this is quite interesting as well as ECDPM and as ETTG, European Think Tanks Group and ECDPM, uh, to have an Asian perspective on many of these issues uh, relating to the global uh, and geopolitical changes and the implications for Europe. And then on my left uh, side, we have uh, Kevin, Kevin Verbelen. Kevin Verbelen uh, is a lawyer international trade expert, and you also work for Agoria. And Agoria is quite well known in the Belgian context as uh, an association of tech companies. Uh, if I understood well, uh, you represent something like 2,000 companies, more than 350,000 employees in the tech sector. Quite uh, significant, uh, quite important. And Kevin will give us a kind of uh, a particular case study, I would say, hopefully not too technical, but a case study that is at this moment arousing a lot of interest and creating also quite some tensions in the relationship of the developing world uh, with uh, Europe, um, particularly uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, which is at this moment uh, creating global tensions. And I think your chapter in the book uh, speaks uh, openly of a recipe for disaster, which is quite provocative. So uh, I'm very curious to, to hear more about this. What we will do is to have first an introduction by Len, who will describe the global context 15 minutes. Then we will have already a first round of discussion with questions from the floor. So feel free to think already of the questions that you will and also to make observations. It's not only questions. It, this is a discussion mode. Um, and then we will give the two other speakers, uh, uh, each of them five minutes, to also uh, bring their story, followed again by a discussion round. So with this, Lane, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you so very much, Geert. And 
It's wonderful to be back at ECDPM and to meet old friends again. Um, it, COVID took a lot away from us, so this is absolutely wonderful, and it's even more special to be accompanied by uh, friends and fellow colleagues. Uh, we had a long year together last year in writing, uh, not physically, of course, but uh, virtually. And of course, it's a, a, a great pleasure as well to have here uh, friends from and colleagues from the Policy Center of the New South who came all the way from Morocco to be here with us and everybody else who showed up today. So thank you so very much. Um, just, just a quick 30 seconds on why the book. Um, somewhere about a little over a year ago, I was at Rabat at the Policy Center, which I am a senior fellow as well. And it was clear that quite a lot was happening in the world which seemed to have been at a point of inflection for many reasons. Um, there was COVID, which rather than bringing the world, to, the world together, seemed to have unleashed forces which were pretty divisive. Um, and that was just even before the war. And my sense was that there was a lot of narration in theaters and forums such as this one, ECDPM and others, where lots of northern global actors were speaking to what was happening, the views of the South, um, and pronouncing on behalf of the global South. Um, and my own sense, uh, coming from a policy center of the New South, I straddled two worlds. I'm also a, a senior fellow with the German Marshall Fund of the United States, so I'm very much versed in knowledge of, of, of the North and everything it brings, but also with sensibilities infused by my work and my life also in the Global South. And I felt very much that uh, to be authentic and legitimate, that the South had to pronounce on its own perspective on what was happening in the world. And certainly a policy center for the New South needed to pronounce on it, needed to add to the intellectual debate and discourse and discussion, not for agreement, but to say that different uh, points of views that are also equally legitimate and compelling and needed to be on the table for discussion. So here we are. So I start by just saying what we all, all sort of already know, that these are <coughs> extraordinary times. There's no other way of putting it. We've had uh, a series of um, crises. Um, the word poly crisis almost comes to mind. I'm not going to talk about climate change as a crisis. It's there. I'm going to say that that's the backdrop to two others that came in quick succession. A global pandemic, which brought its own tensions, deepened by the war in Ukraine. And there's a sense that both of these coming in the succession that they did, not only deepened certain trends that we were already aware of, but brought the world almost to an inflection point with respect of not only the distribution of power, but other things that are happening behind the scenes globally. Um, the conversation that we would uh, have, or rather that I would like to have, um, will take a look at several features. One, the way in which great power rivalry set the stage for some of the disruptions that we saw even before COVID. How these tensions and some of the fractures and disruptions that we started to see deepened during COVID. They were made even worse by the war, deepened even further by the act of sanctions. How the Global South is responding and how regional actors have been very alert to this particular moment, not of challenge only, but of opportunity. And what we're seeing today is not just a bipolar world, but a world which has also been seeded with a multi-layered and very complex uh, layers of multipolarity. And in this process of multipolarity and this multi-layering, we've seen a global South no longer feeling that they have to pick a side. They will sit at any table that furthers their interest and indeed, as a result of the war, the sanctions and everything else, they are very much engaged 
in forging their own alliances, deeped in those alliances, and no longer do we get the sense that Western interests are de facto those of the rest of the world. Let's take a look at what was happening just before COVID. So um, if we go back to August 31st, I think when the Americans uh, moved out of Afghanistan, remember those scenes of chaos. Uh, but one of the, the takeaways from that period, of course, is the fact that uh, the transatlantic relationship seemed to have been at an all-time low uh, because EU allies were taken very much by surprise. There was none of the thought of thorough choreographing of this movement out of Afghanistan, even though everybody was talking about the date. Followed 14 days later by the American announcement of something called AUKUS, much to France's dismay, because they had been for 10 years negotiating nuclear submarines with, with Australia. Um, and the EU didn't know. There were no allies on this side of the, the Atlantic uh, that knew that AUKUS was in the making. 14 days after the pullout from Afghanistan, and actually the day, <laughs> the day before the EU announced its own Indo-Pacific strategy. <coughs> there had been no conversation between those allies. And even before that, of course, we had the Trump administration uh, speaking about uh, America, America first, leaving all allies to wonder, well, are we allies or are we not? And remember, of course, Donald Tus Tusk <coughs> saying something like, uh, thanking Donald Trump for reminding us that our friends are at the ends of our own fingers. And then, of course, we moved from that into the period of decoupling rather actively from China. You have COVID deepening those strains, massive disruptions, then Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You have sanctions and war, even deeper disruption, and even upending the process of globalization as we know it. And the new language of these times, de-swifting, local for local, friend sharing. What does it all mean for globalization? What does it mean for North and South or even East and West? The USA has its own, uh, unveiled its own recent IRA, rather unfortunate terminology. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has everything to do with climate change, but offers massive subsidies as well for green industries and further decoupling from China. The EU is considering its own response to that and what it might mean. And the China threat is explicitly defined by the US defense uh, mechanisms, defense, new defense strategy, as well as the new commerce strategy. China is defined very explicitly as the threat to America's hegemony. And importantly, curiously, while most of the rest of the world has condemned, including the Global South, condemned the act of invasion and the act of invasion and, and territorial integrity, yes, in the UN General Assembly, but they have been very cool on the matter of sanctions. The rest of the world, when we even consider the G20, the G20 is completely divided between North and South on the matter of sanctions. India, Brazil, Turkey, Argentina, South Africa, China, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Indonesia are all not implementing sanctions, Western sanctions. We get a sense, therefore, that Western interests are no longer de facto those of the rest of the world. We certainly saw it uh, last year, just before August, July, when President Biden went over to uh, Saudi Arabia asking for more oil because he knew what was happening in the US in terms of prices and the social tensions that was causing. Uh, what did the Saudis do? In August, uh, they increased the, the, the tap by 100,000 barrels a day, which was the lowest in their history of increase. But at that very moment, Congress had in front of them a very hefty military package of hardware for the Saudis. So that was passed, and by September, the Saudis turned back down the pipe, the taps, and started pumping two million barrels a day less, and the prices went up. And then the Saudis were in Beijing, they were in St. Petersburg, and all of that. And even when we take a look at South Africa, for example, uh, South Africa right now is hosting the navies of both China and Russia over, over the period of the 17th to the 27th of February in in naval maneuvers, 
And as South Africa says, it's a logical progression of relations among friends. And last year, indeed, in, in July, the same arrangement was had with the United States uh, navies as well. When we take a look at perhaps some of the reasons for why my sense, which is shared by others, that there's a certain disenchantment by the global south or maybe even the rest of the non-Western world with the West, let's take a look a little bit about the fact that the rest of the world also is paid a very high price for this war. Uh, the OECD uh, seminal report that came out at the end of last year uh, puts it quite bluntly. The rest of the world is paying the price for this war. And not only last year, but 2023 is going to be even more, more hurtful and damaging to global economies. So the forecast <coughs> for this year is 2.7, last year was 3.2. All growth engines have stalled at about the same time. The three major ones, the US, the EU, and China. The hardest hit in all of this is the Global South, and we know it. They've lost already. They are poised to lose a decade of growth, as they did in 1982, when the parallels were the same. Iran, uh, Iraq invading Iran, uh, energy, the first energy shocks, American dollar escalating in, in value, uh, exporting inflation around the world. Countries have been borrowing very cheap money, and the rest was a disaster. There was a huge debt crisis that was focused around Latin American countries and the African countries. And we see the same trend here. But when we take a look at what, what the Global South has already lost, um, by the end of this year, they would have lost 30% of their collective GDP when you take a look at 2019 figures. 56 million were on the brink of starvation in 2019. Already that number is doubled. These are World Bank numbers, it's 105 million. 78 million in sub-Saharan sub Africa were pushed into poverty in the first three months of the war last year. It is 223 by the end of December last year. Soaring inflation, energy crisis, all of these sort of things. Talk about political insecurity. Look at what happened with Sri Lanka. Zambia has already defaulted. Mali, you name it. There are 80 countries from the global south in Latin America, Asia and Africa that are on the brink of what the IMF and World Bank are discussing as significant debt distress. And many will already soon start to be defaulting on their debt. And a number of them have also lined up behind the IMF to get um, uh, standby structural uh, facilitating. What can we say about these times? The war is not in the interest of the rest of the world regardless of how compelling it might be to Western allies and the EU and the United States. And we saw that with Indonesia's presidency last year of the G20. Uh, Indonesia's president was very clear. When certain uh, member states in the G20 wanted to, in fact, have a conversation about the war and Russia, Indonesia pushed back and said, no, we don't want to talk about the war. We want the war to end. We want political stability so we can have growth again. This is what we're interested in. And they have paid a disproportionate price uh, for this war, and now they certainly do not see the war to be in their interest. So now we have a rather broadening sense of disenchantment uh, with the West, and this comes not only on the back of these countries feeling that, you know, economically they have paid a significant price, but we take a look at what happened during COVID. Uh, even with COVAX, and the sense that we are all in this together as one world, not really happening with the issue of vaccines. We don't need to go into that conversation, but we can. Uh, we, we see the Global South all being urged by the IMF and World Bank managing directors, borrow as much as you can. We don't care that this is guidance we don't normally give. Borrow your way so that we can talk about recovery in 2022, and they did. But the instruments that were put in place to help them have not helped. The DSSI, for example, is a drop in the bucket. Last year, these countries played almost $48 billion back in loans. Uh, DSSI provided what, $5 billion, 10, 8, okay? So those instruments were, were just certainly not there. There's also a sense that uh, Global South countries are tired of rules of the game that change when the referee changes. And it's not that these countries are not 
for and don't want a rules-based international order. They want the rules to be consistently applied. And I give you an example of what we talk about. So there is a sense that no sovereign, no country which has been a permanent member of the Security Council has ever invaded another country. And that Russia is the first to do that. And so all of a sudden we're talking at the UN of not allowing the Security Council to have the veto vote. We will go to the UNGA. But we can't all have our own facts. We can have <coughs> different opinions. The fact <coughs> is, there was an invasion of Afghanistan, there was an invasion <coughs> of Iraq. We, can, we have a list. But nobody ever said, let's not take the veto away from the Security Council. What the Global South is also saying is that they want consistency in the rules. They don't want that the rules be modified when it changes because then that legitimacy of the conversation of the narrative becomes lost. So there's <coughs> tired, tiredness with respect of a certain degree of hypocrisy, tiredness about the fact that <laughs> uh, a sense that um, uh, the UN is also being sidelined and a sense of a war which is moving into a zero-sum game. Um, I will skip some things because Gert is, 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 is saying certain things. It's very, but very interesting. No, 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 but, but, but I want to just make a couple of points, Gert, uh, in this, to set the stage for the conversation that, that we will have. I think that it's important to understand that these countries are not picking a side because we hear that they're very quiet on the issue of sanctions. And they're not picking a side simply because it's <coughs> not in their interest to pick a side. That history, geography, and culture are playing a role. And right now, they're deepening their alliances and groups in which non-Western interests are much more important. They're hedging their bets against an uncertain future. And they're acutely aware of the shifting, uh, the changes in, in the future of global wealth. Uh, so, for example, in the 1960s, the United States, um, you know, was responsible for 40% of global output. It's now 25%. It's declining. By 2030, China will be the world's largest economy. By 2030, three of the top four economies in the world will be in Asia. Um, the EU share of 25% in 1990s will be 11% by 2030 will be less than half of China's uh, a decade after that. So what, what are these countries doing? And then I'll pause there. The first thing the rest of the world is doing, uh, very deliberately, but with speed, is that they're securing their interests in non-Western alliances. And if we take a look at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which formerly was China, was India, was a number of Central Asian states, everybody's on the list to become a member, including Turkey, a NATO state, and all of the Arabs, including Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, you name it. They're forming their own alliances. Uh, take a look at the BRICS. It's five or six countries. Now everybody else is on the list to become a member of the BRICS. Um, if we take a look at the BRICS even today without expanding their membership, the BRICS by 2030 will, will be responsible for 50% of global output, 50% of world's population, 60% of, of global gas reserves. They're also building new routes together, bypassing the Suez Canal, bypassing Europe and Europe sanctions. Um, that has been done through Iran, Russia, India. They're doing this in Pakistan. They're increasing trade among themselves. They're bypassing SWIFT. They're using um, Visa and MasterCards, which don't use the greenback. Uh, they use China and Russian cross-border uh, systems payments. Modi is going to be in the chair, is in the chair of 2023 for the G20 presidency. And he has called for a global summit of Voices of the South. And he has made it quite clear. He says, we're not looking to divide the world. We see the world as one planet, one family, one future. But the world is changing, and the global south cannot stay poor forever when they are the majority of the world's population. The rules of the game have to change, and these countries require a seat at the table and need to be treated with dignity, with respect. 
and with equity. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shaheen. This is uh, quite a, <laughs> quite a complete and provocative uh, opening uh, for this discussion. Um, I think it uh, will arouse a lot of uh, questions. So let's start with uh, a first round. Who would like to react? Uh, yes, I what see. What should we do? <laughs> what do we have to do? What does Europe have to do? to overcome that anti-Western sentiment or Wait a second, we take a few more. Yeah. Shada? Thank you, Ishmael. I thought that was really brilliant. Uh, you've said what I've been saying for some time. You said it better. Thank you very much oh, for that. Thank you, Shada. I'm just wondering, to what extent are we talking about a new, I've seen this in some Western papers, new non-aligned movement. And I think there's a big difference in what we're talking about, but I'd be interested to get your, your opinions on it. Thank you. Other observations? Yes, Jean-Claude? Maybe, maybe always present yourself oh, for those. Uh, Shada is uh, very well known in the Brussels scene, but it's always good to say... Uh, yeah, I'm in the working independently in the Okay. I'm Jean-Claude Boilin, a former EU official and ambassador, and now a board member of an ECDBM, Board of Governance. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, how relevant today is this concept of global south? Is this global south really global, or is it also fragmented by the impact of some of the crises that you mentioned? And are the West countries or North countries considering the south as a global entity, or are they not tempted today for some of their interests to fragment the south in order to obtain certain achievements for certain reasons? So, global or not global? Thank you. Thank you, Mariela. Hi, uh, Mariela Dichomo, I am the Associate Director for Europe and Africa at ECDBM. Um, thank you, Len, for this uh, yeah, quite provocative and articulate presentation, but I really liked it. Um, what makes me think when you were talking, I said, well, maybe we are very scared about these things, but people who have worked in our sector have heard many, many times that you know, it would be great if the global south of African countries were more proactive in presenting their demands and were able to pursue them more consistently. So my thinking is, do we really have to be worried and what are actually the opportunities that come from these challenging scenarios today? Thank you. Okay, I think we'll stop here. Maybe, um, I think the question, what should be done, eh, I think is a very interesting question because that puts us a little bit in a future perspective. and. Um, I could add to that maybe uh, when you said that this war is not in the interest of the global south, uh, that sanctions, of course, are not in the interest of the global south, but what should we have done if there is this aggression by Russia at this very moment? Should you just say no sanctions, uh, let's continue life the way it is uh, going on, and let's put in take uh, parts of Ukraine? At a certain moment, we should also be realistic and also say that this is an element that uh, should be uh, <coughs> probably done, uh, that sanctions are taken towards these types of aggressions. And mm -hmm. So I would like to add this to the questions that were uh, put to you, uh, particularly also the question on the relevance and the coherence of the Global South is also a very mm -hmm. interesting question. I think, thank you, Gip. I think that uh, what should we do is, is, is a very introspective an important question. I think what we should not do are some of the things the EU is doing right now. For example, uh, the EU last year in, in announcing the Global Gateway, uh, 300 billion, announced it as an alternative to China's One Belt, One Road. How could it ever be possibly considered an alternative? The One Belt, One Road has been in existence for, from 2013 with investments of over one trillion. So last year we come out with 300 billion, 150 for Africa, and it's an alternative. But it's presented that way, it's not attractive. It doesn't make it competitive. Why is it just not presented as another element in the toolkit to assist African-led development? That is a very different thing. It doesn't need to be contextualized as a contest because that contest has been lost a long time ago. Why are we talking about that? I think there is a reluctance to be alert to what today means. And are we scared? Um, is it arrogant to still believe that things, the world, 
is the way that it was before, even though the evidence, empirically, the numbers are there, you know? So what is it? And I think that there was an opportunity, maybe after the last financial crisis, for the West and the rest of the world to come together, uh, speaking honestly and frankly about a new view of development, but with partners equally valued and respected. We have not, we missed that opportunity. Maybe we have an opportunity here now. Uh, the EU, for example, right now in its new Green Deal uh, that Kevin will speak about, you know, has policies that are very injurious to African farmers and, and Brazilians and Indonesians and everybody else it works with. At the same time that the EU is actively in Africa, both as Team Europe, as the EU, and also bilaterally, engage in saying to Africans, turn on the taps, we need more fossil fuels fossil fuels now for our security because we need to replace it from Russian sources. And then the Africans are saying, but what about our energy poverty? There's no conversation about the fact that our energy poverty needs to be addressed with the same urgency and care as attention if we are genuine partners. And what about stranded assets 40 years from now or 20 years or five years when your emergency is over? We're holding on to assets that no longer have any value. Is that a genuine partnership? Unless the narrative changes, unless the view of what a genuine partnership is all about, unless we listen more, I think we're going down a rabbit hole where we can't expect different, different, different sorts of, of outcomes. And at what we lose globally is the multilateralism that's required to deal with the global governance agenda of our times. Climate change needs everybody around the table, okay? Um, and then this whole issue of, you know, well, to the global south that, you know, you need to be with us or against us and China and Russia can't be friends. Well, China and Russia have always been friends and that's not going to change. And there's a point at which the Western world needs to get used to that. You know, and India will tell you, and South Africa will say, when we were fighting apartheid and other groups were in fact supporting UNITO or the, 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 the opposition groups when the ANC was fighting, I mean, these were friends. And friendship and history mean something. We can't deny history, neither can we deny geography. Look at the role the Turkeys played. So, History, culture, geography means something. Friendship and solidarity means something as well. The new non-aligned movement, um, it's, it, it is the same, the same groups who were there in the 50s and the 60s are the groups whom today are also around the table, except that now you have the Arabs and you have the Gulf states also as part of that conversation. And they hedge in their bets against the future. But they also see the way in which uh, global power is shifting and they're aligning themselves to that pole because that's what countries driven by their own sovereignty and their interests will do, which is what the West also does. But there is a different take 60, 70, 80 years later. Uh, <laughs> the non-aligned movement of the 50s were very poor countries coming out of being colonies. These are countries with some of the largest economies in the world today. They're using their wealth and transforming that wealth into equity on the global stage in terms of political power. So when Modi says the voices of the South <coughs> need to have a shape, uh, a say in the shaping of this new world, and what we want is multipolarity. They're right. They have been asking for decades, certainly, Increasingly in the last 10 years, they have been asking for a seat at the table with global reform to the UN, to the Bretton Woods institutions, and they've been sidelined. They're forming their own institutions. The BRICS have their own bank, the new bank. It has been in existence now for nine years. It's triple A rated. The Asian Infrastructure Development Bank is triple A rated. They're building their own institutions. Does that, at some point, will mean that we have to ask ourselves, will Western institutions be irrelevant? And then 
What should we have done instead of sanction? Are we very sure that we exhausted diplomacy before even this invasion took place? And what about after the first seven days when President Zelensky said, not another Ukrainian will die? I want, we must sit down. What has happened? We're moving into the second year. We're fighting now a zero-sum game. The Minister of Defense of Zelensky says, what do you mean we are not NATO? We are NATO. It's just that our name doesn't say so. There's a war going on in which Russia is facing NATO in everything but name. We are escalating, not escalating. Has diplomacy failed? And what about globalization? The stability that allowed us all to, to benefit and allowed, lifted so many millions out of poverty. Well, if we're only going to be French oring, well, French oring means something to the Global South too. They're French oring too. They're building new trade routes, even now with Africa and the Caribbean and Latin America. What does that mean for the world? Thank you, Lane. I know that there will be, again, many more questions, and you will s definitely have a second uh, opportunity. But let's first listen to our two other speakers. Uh, we still have 45 minutes left. So we first start uh, with Christian, uh, with the Asian story, which is quite interesting for many of the people here in this audience, uh, because we are not always familiar with this uh, Asian reality, particularly the Southeast Asian uh, region, which you cover so well, uh, also in the book. Uh, so please, Christian. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to talk after Len. <laughs> He's very articulated, so I'm going to look very confused. <laughs> so I try to dispel <coughs> this. Uh, but um, the chapter in the book uh, covers Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asia is actually a large region. It's the size of Europe uh, in terms of, uh, of <coughs> scale, geographic scale, 660 million people, three and a half trillion um, uh, GDP, two and a half trillion uh, trading. It's not huge, but this is not small. And geographically, is a strategic uh, location for the last 500 years, I would say, yeah? not, uh, not recently. Yeah? And so in, uh, in the chapter, uh, within the context uh, set by Len on uh, the Global South versus, uh, versus uh, the Global West, or uh, Europe, uh, as the title of the book, uh, I ex explore uh, four questions. Uh, one question is which events of the last 10 years before COVID, uh, which events actually are relevant in understanding today's uh, position in Southeast Asia? My second question, which is the second section in the, uh, in the chapter, which events during the COVID crisis uh, some kind of shape uh, the perception and the policies uh, that we are seeing today? This is all to say that any, all the observations we have uh, today about so Southeast Asia are some kind of rooted in some recent past or less recent past. Yeah? Uh, the third question is uh, how Russia, Ukraine, why is perceived? And why is it perceived mostly as a Western problem, uh, even though that may be some kind of a shock here, but that's, uh, that's the way it is. And uh, the last question is what, what might be uh, the impact, the consequence of both the COVID and the Russia-Ukraine uh, war uh, on uh, Southeast ASEAN as, as a set of countries and, and ASEAN as an institution with some kind of the umbrella of uh, or the political umbrella of uh, this, uh, this region. So I'm just going to walk through uh, the question two and three uh, because my time is some kind of limited. Uh, so if I take the question two, uh, which events during the COVID uh, shaped the perception and the policy that we are seeing today? And the first event is that in the middle of the COVID in 2020, when Southeast Asians were asking for vaccine, uh, they got none from the West. Yeah? We didn't have much to offer anyway. <laughs> but in 2021, uh, we didn't offer much anyway. Yeah. And all the vaccine came from China. Yeah. So I know the controversy about the, the Chinese uh, vaccine. But the bottom line, uh, in the middle of a crisis, uh, the, the country that some kind of uh, respond to the, to the call uh, was China. And we must put this into the context of 1997. In 1997, we had a massive financial crisis in Southeast Asia, and, and uh, the country that re responded positively uh, to support uh, uh, Southeast Asian country was China too. 
So you have some kind of a repeat of his story here in a different field. And uh, on the other hand, uh, China got uh, extremely assertive in South China Sea and tried to push its position here and there. And, uh, and, and that's some kind of uh, uh, hoping that, uh, you know, that the vaccine would, uh, would, be, uh, would be helping in pushing other, uh, other agenda. And as a result, uh, you had some very quick change in the security architecture with the Quad, which was revived. It's an arrangement between, uh, between India, Japan, uh, US, and, and Australia. And uh, Len mentioned AUKUS, which come as a surprise in September 2021, on the day where the French lost all our submarines uh, deal. <laughs> and then you have the third question, how Russia-Ukraine war is perceived? Uh, it was actually a mild reaction. It takes nearly a week for most of the South East Asian country to come up with a communicate, with the exception of Singapore, who very much side uh, with, uh, with the West, uh, with America, for all kind of reason, which we have no time to explore. But it takes quite a few days, took a few days for everybody to come up with a community. But generally speaking, uh, South East Asian country are opposed to ostracize Russia, to isolate Russia. That is not because of Russia itself, but generally speaking, in the way you conduct diplomacy uh, among ASEAN countries, and you can see with, with the crisis in Myanmar, ASEAN, as a cultures, are not going to isolate another country. They are going to keep channel of communication open no matter what. Yeah? So th they are some kind of uncomfortable with this idea of isolation. Uh, that's one. And number two, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, what is happening in, in, in Ukraine is very much another European war in a, in, a, in a 200, 300 years of history. It's just, here we go, one war again, you know. And uh, the, the narrative about the deep reasons of the war, not the, the immediate reason which uh, Russia clearly invaded uh, Ukraine, uh, but uh, the narrative around the, the reason for the war from a Southeast Asia, Asian point of view actually are not very clear. That may be a surprise here, but if you look in the press, the way it's reported, and the way people talk about it in the elite, uh, that's, that's what comes out here. Yeah? This is mostly seen today as a NATO versus Russia conflict. The number two is that uh, there is also sanction fatigue, because half of the Southeast Asian country were sanctioned in the past very much unilaterally. So most of them are off the hook, with the exception of Myanmar, uh, but uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, just name them, you know, uh, Thailand, <laughs> uh, uh, we, we're all sanctioned at some point of time in the last, uh, the last 20 years, yeah. So they feel that uh, some kind of uh, endorsing the sanctions against another non-Western uh, country or whether Russia belongs to the global south, uh, I do not know, uh, but that was not really a good idea. And I think, Len, you mentioned the double standard, the, the, this, this double speak and double standard uh, around, uh, around why we should sanction or why we should not sanction uh, people in Southeast Asia are uncomfortable. So beside the, 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 the analysis of interest, uh, uh, you can see that Southeast Asia also want to affirm uh, an independence of thinking and positions uh, to the international uh, community. You know, for them, uh, today still, uh, they don't see Russia as an adversary in the context I described, obviously, uh, which is not the immediate uh, uh, events in Ukraine. Yeah. And there are also some dissatisfaction with the, the, the international system itself. You know, so it's expressed through the defiance uh, in the vote uh, in the United Nations. In the fourth question that, uh, that I explore in the chapter, what might be the impact and consequence, uh, if any, of the combination of COVID and uh, the Russian Ukraine war? Uh, there are four areas. One area is trade, the other area is security, uh, international politics, and ASEAN structure. Yeah? In the area of trade, uh, it's quite a bit, because uh, Southeast Asia, 84% of the GDP is the trade ratio. So Southeast Asia has been depending on trading for centuries. And the, the multilateral institution, uh, I'm talking about the WTO, uh, the way the trade is a structure, 
it's been extremely beneficial to Southeast Asia. And obviously, uh, they are observing with a lot of uh, worry uh, the, the, the US-China uh, uh, spats and, uh, and competition, which seems to be moving away, uh, despite all the statements, yeah, uh, moving away from international trade or free trade. Yeah? Uh, and that affects their domestic agenda. All Southeast Asian countries are focused on their domestic agenda, consolidating powers, improving prosperity, <coughs> lowering <coughs> poverty. That's, that's all their position can be related to uh, domestic uh, policy. They also uh, notice that uh, China might no longer be the growth engine of the past uh, <coughs> as it was the last 10 years and therefore uh, they, they need to keep uh, trade ties with uh, everybody. That's not the moment to cut ties. Uh, and that is really the end of what I call the inclusive globalization where we would be able to trade among adversary, uh, but uh, no, now you mentioned French shoring. Uh, so uh, for Southeast Asia, that's an issue because they are trading with uh, everyone and certainly they don't want to make a choice here. In the field of security, it was clearly a collective wake up call. So when Southeast Asia do not vote at the United Nations, it does not mean that they endorse Russia. Those are different things, yeah? Uh, you can see in the press sometimes there are some shortcuts which are certainly not, uh, not welcome, yeah? Uh, but they can really realize, they have realized that flashpoint can move extremely quickly into a hot war, yeah? And of course we have in mind Taiwan, but Taiwan is not in Southeast Asia exactly, yeah? But uh, you have all those flashpoints uh, in South China Sea. Just uh, yesterday, you know, uh, the Filipinos just called the Chinese ambassador, asking him, "What are you doing with your uh, your boat in our mm -hmm. place?" You know, uh, again, after something like 200 claims in 2022, and right? 200 uh, notice verbal in two, in 2022 against China. You know? And so, because of that, because of this this uncertainty, uh, South Sea. Uh, the, 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 this region really uh, stick to the strategy of hedging, which is managing the uncertainty, managing the risk, and uh, uh, keeping a relation with everybody. Yeah? Uh, in the field of international politics, uh, they have noticed the multiplication of many, many new institutions. Before those crises, those institutions were maybe not very prominent, but uh, you talk about uh, SEO, BRICS seems to be reviving with pot potentially new members. Yeah, uh, I w I, We have no time, but we can talk about currency. I can tell you that between ASEAN and China, out of a trillion dollar uh, uh, trade exchange, we have 500 billion dollars which are settled in renminbi today. This is massive. This is a small, at the global scale, 2%. Uh, yes, uh, one minute. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but this is actually actually massive. So, in some kind of quick conclusion, uh, the the I, I won't talk about ASEAN centrality. You are, you have to read the book. Uh, they, but uh, ASEAN always try to put itself at the center of the region in terms of convening great powers. But of course, the <coughs> multiplication of competing institutions in the field of trade or security is challenging that position. But I really want to finish on that point. Uh, it's uh, interestingly, uh, if you look at the legitimacy index of Southeast Asian countries in the last 10 years, all the states, even though they are not full democracies, have improved their state legitimacy. That is a very interesting point because if you compare the Western country over the same period, Actually, all, mostly, almost all the states uh, in Western Europe and US too, uh, actually have lost some legitimacy points. And because of that, Southeast Asian feel that they don't need to be lectured from anyone. My state legitimacy is improving. My legitimacy with my own uh, uh, population is improving. The management of the COVID has been quite successfully perceived by the population. And so uh, they feel that they can set their policy and their voice on their own. And just to, to close, uh, the, the view in, in, in many elites in Southeast Asia is that the COVID time, the economic crisis of 2008, which was a Western financial crisis, time the Russian conflict, 
is globally a failure of good governance and a failure of the West in governance. And therefore, uh, they do not see why they should uh, take uh, advice from uh, this part of the world. And I close my, uh, <laughs> my chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Christian, for uh, again a very provocative uh, uh, presentation. Um, provocative and also for most of us who are dealing with Europe-Africa relations, we recognize a lot of the elements that you have been uh, mentioned. Eh? The, the patronizing uh, attitude, the lecturing, the double standards, uh, the way the COVID uh, 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 approach of Europe has not necessarily convinced the countries in the global south, uh, vaccines and all these uh, issues. We can come back to that uh, later on in the discussions, but it is uh, a very interesting complement to what uh, Lane said, very provocative, and I'm sure that some of you will disagree, so it's definitely uh, time after the presentation of Kevin to have further discussions. Uh, now we go to uh, another type of example of uh, what we could call unilateral measures taken by, in this case, the European Union with the Green Day deal, eh, with the uh, carbon uh, border adjustment uh, mechanism. Um, please, the floor is yours. Five minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, indeed, it's, I think throughout the presentations that we hear today, and um, um, if you read the book as well, it's indeed something on the table for discussion. You've heard uh, we talk about provocation, um, and I think um, the difference with, uh, with many other writers is that I'm born and raised in Brussels, so um, I'm, I'm writing from the heart of Europe and actually trying to provide something provocative as well, which I've tried on, on, a, on a theme um, that is actually um, something that is very close to the heart of the European Parliament, very close to the heart of the European Commission and of member states. And so in that, in that sense, um, it's, um, it's uh, not easy to be uh, somebody writing um, uh, about a topic that, um, that is so close to their hearts and, and believing that this is an element in, in uh, greening the economy in, uh, in, in Europe. But it's actually tapping into what we have been uh, discussing today as well. Uh, tapping into um, a unilateral approach to multilateral issues. Um, and that is, I think, uh, the, the main point of, 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 uh, of the chapter as well. Um, it's definitely not a pamphlet, uh, of, not written as a pamphlet against uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, but indeed it, it, has, it, it can be a recipe for, for many, many issues along the way, which I tried to explain. Um, the difficulty that you have with many European legislations is that you need a lot of words in order to explain what it actually is. Uh, there was a, a discussion I had with Len during the writing of the, of the, of the chapter. Uh, you need quite a lot of pages before you have actually explained what, what the mechanism is. But in that lays also an issue because you have to not only understand it yourself, you have to explain it to those uh, that will have to deal with the mechanism, and you have to explain it to your uh, trade partners. Uh, who also have to understand and it. And you That's will explain it in two phases. And I will try to explain yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what it is, because the carbon border adjustment measure is indeed part of um, the Green Deal, uh, the Fit for 55, to be precise. And Fit for 55 is uh, an entire package in which the EU tries to uh, increase its, um, its speed by decarbonizing the economy. Um, and it's an instrument um, uh, advocated to combat what we call carbon leakage. And carbon leakage, uh, trying to explain it very briefly, means companies saying, I do not stay in Europe where there are very high climate ambitions and I go to produce somewhere else uh, outside of the EU and I will just import my goods into the EU and in that way I uh, can continue to produce uh, because the climate ambitions are lower in the rest of the world. Well, we have in the EU an ETS, Emission Trading System. That Emission Trading System is also in the package for uh, the Fit for 55 uh, being revised in order to have more ambitious uh, uh, goals. Um, but with that ETS, uh, the Emission Trading System, uh, you also have uh, what they call um, uh, free allocation of emissions. So certain heavy industries receive free allocation, can uh, emit um, uh, more than, than other sectors, which can be perceived as a subsidy. And I would have to go and explain in details how the World Trade Organization has uh, rules on, on subsidies, but uh, again, we can, we can talk for hours, and I don't have that. Um, so um, what I try to explain in the book is that there are actually a few issues uh, uh, with, with the carbon border adjustment measure. The 
first one is that, um, uh, yeah, even in the EU financial statement on the carbon border, just not measure, just recently um, um, uh, proposed, it says that the measure in itself will lead by 2030 to uh, economic contraction. Uh, so it's it's going to have an effect on uh, on the economy, which means that the question mark can be put uh, next to its objective, namely to combat carbon leakage, namely that business would leave the European Union because there are lower uh, climate ambitions outside of the EU than inside the EU. That's the first issue. The second issue is that uh, it brings a lot, a lot of red tape, a lot of administration. Uh, a carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism authority has to be set up. There will be certificates that have to be bought. You will have as a company, when you are either buying uh, emission rights in the EU through the ETS or you are importing, you will have to pay at the border but because we cannot exactly say in each plant in China or elsewhere in the world how much um, uh, CO2 is exactly uh, exhausted, uh, the EU will start this carbon border adjustment mechanism with default, um, uh, default uh, emission uh, um, levels per country. So not per uh, plant, but per country, uh, which means you have to take into the mix of, of uh, production sites. Uh, they have uh, in this mechanism also <laughs> included um, uh, indirect emissions. I'll give a very concrete example to explain what that means. If you are producing aluminium, you can say this is the amount of CO2 in this aluminium. But the electricity I have used to produce that aluminium in itself also has um, CO2. Uh, it can be next to a hydro plant or it can be next to a coal plant uh, where we produce uh, uh, that electricity. And so in itself, there is also um, uh, CO2. So you have to calculate those indirects also into the aluminium that you then import. Same with uh, solar panels. Same with solar yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the question, the question is how, as a company, mm -hmm. if you would have to say, for instance, you declare to the commission or, or to our customs, because it will be the customs mm -hmm. administrations that will have to check those, those documentations, if you say it's 20 tons CO2, but uh, the European Union says 25 ton uh, CO2, you, you end up in a discussion and again, uh, that's for businesses to, to understand how are we going to um, get um, uh, all that information and how are we going to defend and prove uh, properly uh, what we are declaring. Um, and for that also the European Union is uh, going to introduce verifiers and those verifiers will have to go around the world to go and actually see what the emissions are of certain plants. I, uh, yeah, um, again, uh, we're also trying to provoke sometimes a little bit. I'm wondering how well perceived those verifiers will be in China, for instance, to go and check in certain production centers, um, mm -hmm. to go and see how much CO2 is exactly exhausted. But in any case, that's all part of this of this mechanism that is being um, uh, presented. But, and that is then where we make the link with, with the Global South, um, if we um, look at the carbon border adjustment mechanism, it is indeed trying to mirror the emission trading system of the EU to uh, what is being imported. Um, and there is uh, an exception foreseen for Norway, there is an exception foreseen for Switzerland because they are part of the European uh, emission trading system. Canada has also a type of CBAM and now recently the United Kingdom has said that uh, as the CBAM is coming in the EU, the, e the UK will also need its own CBAM. So China also has uh, a, a kind of uh, ETS mechanism, um, but the prices on the carbon are very low. Um, I think that the average price for a ton of CO2 emission in the EU is about 90 euros, and in China it's 0 0.02 uh, euros. Mm -hmm. So it gives an explanation. There there, there will be a, an adjustment, uh, um, but it shows that um, the EU tries to impose a certain way of working with carbon. Um, it tries to impose it on the rest of the world. Perhaps, and that is one of the things that is being put in the, book, in the, in the chapter, perhaps it would have been wiser uh, if uh, the EU is an advocate for multilateralism to first look for a kind of a carbon club before going its own way and saying we need this ETS or the mirror of the ETS towards uh, imported goods. It would have been wiser to look for a, a, a club and involve its trading partners because, um, to just give an example, Morocco, we do know that there is uh, a lot of uh, solar energy in Morocco, um, but there is also uh, traditional conventional production of electricity and traditional and conventional production of uh, aluminium, of steel. Uh, at the same time, it could be a very good partner for hydrogen production. 
uh, but hydrogen is also going to be part in the scope of the carbon border adjustment measure. So um, how is the, carb the hydrogen being produced in Morocco? Um, if you are going to use default prices, you're not really involving your trade partners from the start. And uh, the fact that, uh, for instance, India or even Australia, uh, arguably a, a member of the Global South, is saying this is a, a pure protectionist um, tool of the European Union in order to preserve production um, uh, in the EU for EU uh, consumption. Um, that is uh, an, an, an indication of where we're heading. And then uh, if we want to add to that, uh, the, the further complication, that is that we here indeed have a World Trade Organization in which we cannot bring any uh, cases because the appellate body is de facto uh, non-existent. Um, that means that um, in the best case scenario, we do have arbitration in order to figure out whether this carbon border adjustment measure is compatible with the international trade rules to which the EU is not only saying that it wishes to adhere, but also tries to advocate for them. Um, that's the first thing, but in the worst case scenario, countries will just start retaliating on goods uh, from uh, the EU when they are being exported, which makes it extra hard for businesses, because of course, working for uh, businesses, I uh, uh, of course also look into what the effects are for, for, for the private sector. And the question is then, uh, if you have to pay an ETS, an e a sharpened <coughs> ETS, and you have to pay CBAM on the imported input in your products into the EU, um, if you have not something uh, like that in the rest of the world, how are you even going to be competitive uh, on markets outside of the EU? So that is the first question. The second question is indeed that if com other countries would start to retaliate, even without looking at uh, uh, World Trade Organization <coughs> cases, well, then it will become even more complicated. So there is a lot of levels in this carbon border adjustment measure and come back to the point that I made uh, before, where even though the EU is advocating a lot of multilateralism and wishes to adhere to the multilateral trading system, it's actually with the CBAM proving in action, not in lip service, but in action, that it might actually take um, sometimes without really looking at the rest of the world, unilateral actions that have very big uh, effects, not only inside the EU, but also outside. Yes, well. <laughs> I wonder if I could just say something to Kevin very, very quickly yes. before you open it up. Yeah. Because one of the yeah. important things that we discussed, Kevin, is the effects on African farmers who already are meeting high standards, will have even higher standards imposed, and already can't compete very fairly with EU farmers because mm -hmm. of the cap and other subsidies that they, they receive. At the same time that Africa, the agricultural sector, is huge for Africa, right? in terms of GDP and employment, at the time that the continent needs to trade out of poverty, at the time mm. that the EU is in Africa wanting more fossil fuel, you have this penalty on the agricultural sector and farmers, which makes it really, really very difficult in a partnership. Absolutely. Yes. Um, do you want to react to this? Because otherwise, well, we go it directly into the discussion. Perhaps, perhaps I indeed need to, to add uh, just mm -hmm. a little a little point. So indeed, if we look at the scope of the carbon border adjustment measure, it's only being selected in certain sectors. Huh? Um, very quickly, very quickly uh, put together, we're talking about fertilizers, we're talking about cement, uh, aluminium, steel, iron, um, uh, electricity, but also hydrogen. Uh, precursors used mm. for uh, the production of those those sectors. Agriculture is not as such in it, um, but, and this is very important, the CBAM is one example, and in the chapter we also mention a few other uh, examples. For instance, the Lulu CF, which is the land use and land use change and forestry regulation of the EU. We look at the, car, uh, the corporate sustainability due diligence directive. We look at the conflict minerals uh, regulations. So there are very, there are a lot of different uh, regulations made by the EU, which all, if you look at the, the ideas behind it, why they are being proposed, are of course to be applauded for, but what are the effects, not just inside the EU, but also in, in particular uh, in trading partners when you are dealing with this type of legislation that are actually put, again, we'll come to the point, uh, uh, unilaterally imposed on, on Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the, the three presentations and definitely uh, the two last ones as well, uh, we listened already uh, and we had already discussions on your presentation, but some of you 
uh, might come back to what was said also in the first half hour, but they point very much to a number of tensions, underlying frustrations. I think you could also look at these things from two types of angles sometimes, and that's what we need to do in this discussion. Eh? On the CBM, for example, you could also say, look, the European Union, in the absence of being a global a military power, uh, is maybe an interesting uh, example of a, a, a norm setter, a, a trend setter in terms of standards, uh, and that's maybe also something that, that should be done by someone eh, at a certain moment, but I take your point that this should always be done in full consultation with the rest of the world, with the multilateral system. Now, who would like to uh, uh, make observations? I think I saw Peter already. And then Shada, uh, please Peter, and then Sun, please Peter, make yourself known for those who do not yet know you. Yeah. Um Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, Shada, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I asked a question, Lynn, on non-alignment that I'd like you to answer, but um, Gage, yeah, you often said uh, that these are provo provocative statements. I don't think they're provocative. They're provocative in this town because people are in a bubble uh, and don't actually hear voices like Lynn and Christian and, and, and yourself, of course, as well. Um, so I think they're not provocative. They open our minds. and. Uh, force us actually to look at how other people, those in the rest of the world, 
look at us, and I think that's mm. very, very crucial. Um, a couple of things that I've written about and have noticed is that the democracy versus autocracy argument that was used, uh, Christian, I think, in, the, in ASEAN went down very, very badly, because that's not what they want to hear. They are a mix of those different uh, structures. The other thing was global gateway, yes, of course, but you didn't mention, and I think it's a very important point, and I've written about it in The Guardian today, actually, is our migration policies. As Europeans, we are breaking up our own rules and our own values and our international commitments on issues to do with migration every single day. The EU's leaders summit just last week on Friday was a vivid example of how that's been done. And that is linked to racism, discrimination, police violence in Europe. Black Lives Matter in Europe is also a movement. So all of these issues, I think, are also on the table and do influence and color how the global South sees Europe. And it's part of this, not to mention colonization, but I'm talking about the reality of today. And it's very much part of that the global South's vision, perception, and now reaction to the war in Ukraine. I think all of this comes in as well. So I'm just making that point. It is very crucial to take a bigger picture, and I think it's very, very incumbent on Peter, uh, Peter as well. I think, Peter, thank you very much for making this very good comment, that we in Europe listen, listen to these voices. They are there. And I'd like to buy the book, so how do I buy the books? Yeah. <laughs> it's on Amazon. <laughs> Amazon? Yeah. yeah. Kindle as well? Sorry? Kindle as well? Uh, so yes. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, uh, just an observation. Um, I, I think you're fully right, a point well taken, um, that this debate is absolutely needed. But sometimes we should be also a little bit more digging into what we call the voices of the so-called South. Eh? Is this the leadership that is talking? Are these the populations that are talking? Eh? There is a study that is just recently out by the South African Institute of International Affairs. They analyzed one million tweets and there it appears that there's a lot of sympathy for Europe on the whole issue of uh, 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 Ukraine, while the leadership in many of these countries in Africa are absolutely fully in line with many of the points that you ha have been making here, but the populations are not necessarily following this. And I think we should also mention that. Yeah. Can I just comment yeah. on one point as well? You made the point, you did, Jeff, actually, uh, of norm setter, the European, yeah. the Brussels effect. Well, you know, we've lived behind that sort of, let's say, smoke screen for a very long time. Because in today's world, we are no longer norm setters when it comes to issues like CBAM that you're talking about. We've become a, it's become a protectionist impediment mm. and actually erodes Europe's norm setting soft power uh, in today's world. So the world has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think our parliamentarians, and unlike Peter, most of our EU officials do not understand how much the world has changed. And when our ambassadors in the global south send that message to headquarters, it isn't listened to. Mm. It isn't taken account of. That is the big tragedy that you're bringing in today, this disconnect between Brussels and the rest of the, I would say, the world. Yeah, excellent. We will give all, each of you the, the, the possibility to react. Eh? Uh, but some was, yeah, Car Carl, please. I'd like to come back on the, the that individuals do still sympathy with Europe. Yes. That, that's, a, that's a funny thing, you know, that uh, I interviewed 900 young engineers, economists, educated in Africa. And they, are, they have an anti-Western resentment. But the parents, they still have sympathy with us. So we should take advantage of this. I feel, mm -hmm. I feel that we should take advantage. That still there's a, there's a, there's a a large part of, of the African population has sympathy for us. They do not take, they do not take advantage of it. Mm. That's my, that is my remark. Yeah. Okay. Even if they're educated people, don't they say, no, we are against the, the, the France Gage. I see those slogans everywhere in Africa. France Gage, eh? France Gage. And the parents, they say, no, no, we, we, want, we want to continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They like our Western style, mm -hmm. our, our Western living conditions. They like that, you know. Yeah. They're against us, but they like our style, our mm. conditions. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Uh, Sam. Uh, thanks. Uh, I have just two points, uh, oh, one point and one question. When we talk about the global south and the, and the west, perhaps we should also differentiate because there's not one global south, <coughs> there's not even one west. No? Europe global uh, west. Oh, yeah, but when we hear about the tensions Why? between the US yeah. and Europe, 
um, you know, not even to go about the Trump era, but even now about the green subsidies and so on, or, or Brexit. So I mean, I, I think sometimes we should uh, differentiate and also with, with the population. But my question was, what do you call, a, you were saying there's a need for more genuine relationship. And, and my question was, what would be a more genuine relationship? Because in a sense, is it not some of the elements when you express disagreement and different perspectives, this ability to have different perspectives, a genuine relationship? And are we not still asking, when we ask for a genuine relationship, still asking for something more from the EU? You should be defending norms, you should be helping us, but you should not defend your own interests, you should do what we like, you should not ask us to be uh, your friends and to stand by you when you have difficulties. Uh, you know, is it not normal that from a, you know, a genuine relationship is that there will be different perspectives on the war on Ukraine, that Russia, uh, that, that, uh, <coughs> that Europe uh, decides to have sanctions because they cannot fight military, and then they decide sanctions useful or not, but you know, other countries say they don't like the war, but what are they doing? Diplomacy, we see France, Macron, President Macron has been really uh, put down and you know, the, the telling off by other Europeans and by his compatriots for trying to have these negotiations. Mm -hmm. So uh, should we not accept that there are some differences and the same perhaps for Sibam, I'm not defending if Sibam is good or not, but we will all agree that you know the multilateral system does not work. Europe has been fighting for the multilateral mm -hmm. system and the reason why it doesn't work, partly is China has some elements. By the way, when we differentiate, we should probably differentiate, I mean, we should differentiate between China and Russia. And it's not the same behavior so far. But India is probably the biggest uh, you know, impediment to any kind of multilateral, and the US for the, <coughs> for, for the dispute settlement. So here we see that there is an alliance between these West and, 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 and mm. South actors that are blocking multilateralism. And if it doesn't work, what should Europe do? So my question is, is not this ability to disagree and to have different perspectives and to have even resentment for Africa's own interest a step in the right direction of genuine relationship as opposed to the time when we were saying, you know, Europe should just help us and, and then be pretending to be just benevolent. Good. More questions because I give each of the panelists two to three minutes afterwards, but if there are more questions or observations, uh, please uh, make these uh, observations now. I forgot to say I was from ECDP. <laughs> <laughs> Some below, yeah. Anyone else who would like to uh, uh, intervene? Yes. I'm from ECDPM as well. Hi, Virginia. Um, the, my question is, though, one, when you say we're not taking the side, the, the global south is not taking sides, right? Obviously, from from the West, it looks like in some some countries have taken taken sides, um, and also the big surprise is actually not so much the resentment vis-à-vis -vis the West, which is very understandable and probably also has a lot of merit in it, but the non-solidarity with Ukraine uh, in the war situation, in terms of saying a country attacked and invaded by another, which I mean many in the global South have already had an experience. Why is it that they're not standing up for Ukraine? That was my thought. Good. I think we have uh, a lot of inspiration. We know, uh, thanks to Peter also, what we should not do. But then the next question is, of course, what we should do. And there, uh, the question of sun is quite relevant. Eh? What should be a genuine relationship, uh, knowing that we have uh, differences and that we have to accept that there are major differences? What should be a genuine relationship? Let's maybe start uh, with Christian on this. And That's quite tough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to give Len the last word. Sure. Eh? And so, uh, Christian, please. So I think what should be a genuine relationship? It's you enter a relation without the intention to change the nature of the partner. Once you go into a relationship and you try to change the political regime in South East Asia, I think you are very much at the losing hand. And uh, if you look at, uh, at the elite survey, uh, people, elite in Southeast Asia, are worried about China for their territory, and they are worried about the West for 
a regime, and a political regime. So I think to answer to your question, and I would put it that way, uh, you have to some kind of accept that uh, uh, in, in some part of the world, uh, there, there might never be actually a liberal democracy. And if they have an hybrid regime, which is working good enough for the people, that might be what it's going to be for the next 100 years, you know? Uh, and, and I think that would go a long way to improve everything else in the relationship. Thank you. Kevin. Yeah, um, general relationship I also pick on it, uh, and um, also a few of the, the things we should not do uh, come perhaps back. Um, and it means indeed that we, we should uh, avoid to, um, to be perceived to be lying. Right? One of the elements is that we are in the EU working on, for instance, an anti-coercion instrument, um, but at the same time we have um, in the EU legislation that might be perceived as coercive in other countries. That's one. Uh, a second one is uh, actually, if we talk about the West, eh, we also something that in, the, in Brussels, especially in the Brussels bubble, will be recognized is the extraterritorial working of US sanctions. Eh? Well, we know what that means well, but also our sanctions have extraterritorial working uh, and can in that way also be perceived in, in, a, in a different way than how we see it. So it means that you need to have to listen. It means that you uh, need to have a proper conversation and be open to different points of, uh, of opinion, which um, not always the problem with our diplomats uh, around the world, but uh, especially when you hear the narrative, for instance, in the European Parliament, uh, you, you, you hear that uh, very clear that sometimes they forget to listen. Um, and indeed consistency. And one of the elements, I come back to the chapter that I have uh, written in, in the book, uh, the CBAM has never been discussed in the World Trade Organization, mm -hmm. but it is there. But it shows that indeed if you are talking about multilateralism, this is important, well then it means that you also need to have about this type of legislations, a discussion with your trading partners, perhaps the best location to do it, uh, would be in the World Trade Organization, but it's never been discussed. Thank you, thank you very much. Lynn. Okay, just, just a couple of quick things, and I won't answer all the problems. We need to go to lunch, Sam, <laughs> to, 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 to oh, deal with this, this la last piece. But one of the things that I would just say, I if we talk about partnerships, I mean, there's a long list that we could go into, and we don't need to detain anybody here. But one of the things that I would just say is, is quickly this, on migration, which Seda brought up as well. Don't forget the images that we saw right after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and all the people trying to leave. There were 72,000 people of color in Ukraine. They were mostly Indian and African students. And it was horrific for them. They were denied being able to get on trains and buses. They were told if you're black, you walk. They were beaten back from borders. At the same time when they saw the welcoming given to Ukrainians who look like other Europeans, <coughs> as they are, okay? That was astounding. There was very little conversation about this. Well, okay, I, I'm talking about the press and stuff, okay, okay? But last year in December, it was interesting to see a statement coming out of the Belgian official responsible for dealing with homelessness and refugees and asylum seekers. There was a complaint because uh, uh, there was a lot of homelessness. There were people who were asylum seekers, refugees on the street, and they were sleeping rough in the middle of December. And this official statement was made, and it shocked me. Um, it went something like this. Yes, we understand that we are treating uh, Ukrainian refugees differently. But my goodness, they're not used to poverty and being treated badly. <laughs> so we have to treat them differently. Yes, we put them in housing and stuff, but the others, you know, they're used to that. And I thought it quite <coughs> shocking that in the first world that anyone would dare make a statement like that and it would be okay. Well, the court is, is fining the, the Belgian government for not uh, respecting its duties. Mm. Okay. All right, but I'm just saying it's that in December, so okay. that sort of statement was made, okay? Yeah. And I'm just saying that if we're talking about genuine <coughs> partnership, we don't value others more than others on the basis of what they look like. That's what I mean also by a genuine partnership. We value everybody equally. Um, second quick thing I will say, and then just, just end here, 
Um, there's all of the moralizing. Yes, Europe needs to, like the US, stop moralizing so much. So we take a look at the issue of sanctions. There's a whole debate about whether sanctions are working or not. Have sanctions worked in Cuba after 60 years, 65 years, 70 years? Who have been hurt? The Cuban people have been hurt, okay? But let's take a look at Venezuela. So Maduro was put out in the cold. The EU and the United States opened this nice little uh, uh, embassy in Washington, DC with Guido, Guido, I pronounce his, mis mm -hmm. mispronounce his name, as, as the true president elected by the EU and the United States. Well, very quietly in December, uh, mm -hmm. the Washington embassy closed, the opposition is dismantled, Maduro is in from the coal, uh, American firms are back pumping oil. <laughs> so, for the rest of the world, one asks the question, what are sanctions? It's a tap that we turn on and off when it pleases us and our interests are at stake. Mm. Where's the moral high ground in that? And the last two points I'll make, I think that there have been several miscalculations recently over all of this holy mess. One is that I think, unfortunately, Putin miscalculated. He thought that he had a window based on everything that was said about this being the opportunity to go into Ukraine at a time when uh, the Western solidarity was so weak, based on all the things that we've discussed. And actually, he was told, you heard it, NATO cannot do anything if he were to go in. Maybe that was also a bit of a bait. I'm not sure there either. Uh, I won't say more about that. But there was that miscalculation. The West also miscalculated seriously they miscalculated that this might have been the moment when the rest of the world said, de facto, your interests are no longer ours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, to Lane and to Christian and to Kevin. Very, very interesting discussion. Difficult to synthesize. If I would have to synthesize <laughs> it in one slogan, I would say that we would have to learn um, to uh, uh, agree, let's say, to disagree, uh, and then negotiate, and then negotiate as equal partners without imposition, without double standards, on a much more business-like uh, method uh, than we used to do this in the past. Um, and that is maybe uh, the recipe, because it has been said by some of you, Europe has interests, and it should not be shying away from these interests. It's more a matter of taking account of what is happening elsewhere without imposing unilaterally certain measures uh, that should be duly discussed with uh, the Global South and the different partners uh, that Europe would like to uh, work with. Um, thank you so much for uh, being here and for having this uh, very uh, dynamic debate. I must admit that I liked it very much. It was a very interesting uh, discussion. I hope you also found it uh, interesting. And uh, uh, thanks to our speakers. And I think that uh, those who would like to find the book uh, know that it can be uh, uh, bought at Amazon. But maybe the colleagues from Morocco of the Policy Center of the New South also brought some copies. I don't know. So uh, maybe you should inform yourself to the people in the back of the room. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.